All right, well, today we're going to begin a brand new teaching series that we are calling Roots and Fruits. Roots and Fruits. Why don't you say that one with me? Roots and Fruits. Yeah, I, I told my kids this one, and they like to add toots, roots and fruits and toots. No, we're not going there. We're beginning a brand new series, Roots and Fruits, today. And this idea comes from these metaphors, these analogies. Like, oftentimes, and I don't know if you've noticed this, throughout Scripture, God, Jesus, would use this vernacular that had to do with gardening, with botany, that is from wine to vines to branches to harvest to seeds to roots to fruits. Throughout scripture, we find over and over again this language that comes from growing inside of a garden. Now, any of you gardeners in the room? How many of you have at least grown like a tomato plant or something in your backyard? Okay, you can claim I've got a bit of a green thumb. Some of you are like, well, I kill any plant that I ever had. It's okay, it's okay, I understand. <laughs> Look, it, when I was reading so many of these passages of scripture, it wasn't until I started a garden of my own that, you know, the light bulb just like, bling. Like when you can see something, you've read it for a thousand times over, but now it just kind of comes alive and speaks to you a little bit differently. That's what happened to me when my family started a garden like way back in the day. It was 2020, and I don't know about you, but I had a whole lot more time on my hands, like a lot more time on my hands back in 2020, okay? And so here's what happened is one of the days I'm hanging out with my kids because we had a lot of time together. And one of the stories that they would tell is like I was trying to get them to eat their food, like eat your veggies, like we can't throw that food away. One of them said back to me, but dad, can't we just go down to the grocery store and get more food? I thought, oh my boy. This is a teachable moment. There is a lesson for you to learn here. Your food does not originate from Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> so there's this lesson here, and I thought to myself, being the, you know, the great dad that I am, I'm going to get involved, and I'm going to come and teach them a life lesson. Well, here's what I learned very quickly. It wasn't going to be just them getting the life lesson. <laughs> I was being set up. I was the one that was going to take away some life lessons. And so here's what happens as we begin to build these boxes in the backyard, their raised bed, and we're mixing all of the soil. And I don't know if you know this, but there's so many different things. Your soil is so important, and the kids are getting out here. Well, this is a flashback from the past right here. You're welcome, sweetheart. Now that my teenager is embarrassed up here. And so we would build these out, these boxes, and get our garden ready to go. And we planted things in the ground. And, and then we would just become so, so excited about what was going to happen. And I remember every day, like I would wake up and the kids would come and we'd go outside. And, and I just want to see, has anything sprouted yet? Has anything started to grow? And finally, we would see our lima beans begin to grow up. And I was so, so stoked about that. Our garden would begin to flourish. We were growing everything that you could imagine in our backyard. And it expands on down this side of the image even more. And we would begin to harvest things out. We would get tomatoes. And we would get, what, wait, are those? What? Radishes. I don't know if you can count those, but we were so excited about this. These little radishes coming out and these potatoes. I mean, come on. Have you ever grown potatoes before? Tomatoes, potatoes. I mean, look at these things. It was just so awesome. And so as I was growing all of these things, it became like this, I don't know, this infatuation. And so we went from fruits and veggies to like, now I'm going to plant like some trees in the backyard. I'm talking about peaches and nectarines, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, what other berries? Plums. Uh, everything that you could imagine, we would begin to plant in the backyard. And it was so exciting for us to go out and watch and participate in watching something begin to grow. And as we're talking through this Roots and Fruit series over the next few weeks, I learned some lessons that I see inside of Scripture, so many different ways that God would come alongside and speak to us about spiritual growth, and he would parallel it with lessons that come straight from gardening. And so for just a couple of weeks together, we're going to begin to look at these things, and we're going to watch at some of these spiritual truths begin to come alive. 
So let me just give you an example to get us started, okay? And so this is one of the places where Jesus is going to use this idea of fruits, okay? I mean, I want fruit in my life. You want fruit in your life. Watch what Jesus says here in the book of Matthew. Here's what he says. He says, make a tree, and any time, here's your cue, when it's in blue, that's on you. Okay, you ready? All right, you ready? Okay, let's try this together. Make a tree. Ah, oh, you got it. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Yeah, or make a tree and its fruit will be for a tree is recognized by its fruit. Yeah, yeah. And so Jesus begins to contrast this idea of good fruit and bad fruit. Have you ever ate a piece of bad fruit before? Yeah. Like maybe it wasn't ripe just yet and you got into it. Like it's like spit it back out. It's good for nothing. If you eat it, you're probably going to have a tummy ache in just a bit. Ever ate a bad piece of fruit? Jesus is making this metaphor, and of course, he's not just talking about you know, eating oranges. He's talking about fruit from real life. He's talking about this good fruit and this not-so-good fruit that often is produced, that grows up, that's harvested in our life. And he's talking through this idea, and this is what he says. He talks about good and bad, and for me, I want good fruit. How many of you want good fruit in your life? Some of you want bad fruit just by not raising your hands. I see that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We all want good fruit, right? We all want good fruit. But there's something that happens that must occur before the fruit. I want to show you over the next few minutes that it's root before fruit that will be the determining factor in what you produce, your spiritual growth, the fruit in your life. Here's what I want you to know as we set this up and we're gonna to begin to just lay this out over the next few weeks is here's the key thought and takeaway is that healthy roots produce abundant fruits. Healthy roots produce abundant fruits. Healthy roots produce abundant fruits. And oftentimes while we got, might get fixated on what's the thing that's showing, what's the thing that looks valuable, what's the thing that I long for and that I want, and we see and fixate on fruit, but it's root before fruit. I want to show you what I mean as we begin to unpack this. And so Jesus is the great storyteller. We've been in a series where we talked about some of the parables of Jesus and how he would brilliantly communicate and lay out through story, through analogy, through metaphor, through parables. And Jesus is going to give us one of these parables that helps us to see what is at the core, what's at the heart, what's below the surface. This is the thing that matters because it determines the fruit that's produced. So let me show it to you, okay? And so we're going to read these out loud as we come to them. This is quite a bit of passage. Let me show you the parable. So Jesus is having conversation. He's with his disciples, and Jesus began to teach them by the lake, and then the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and he sat out in it on the lake. And while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he he taught them many parables, and in his teaching, he begins to say. So Jesus is now communicating. This is really important. You have to get the understanding, the framework for what Jesus came to earth to do. One of the key things was to point people towards the kingdom of God. He would begin declaring and proclaiming. He would begin teaching about the contrast with the kingdom of God with the temporary ways of this world. Jesus would come and he would communicate. He would show the values, the pictures of what heaven was to look like here on earth. He would begin to show us what it looks like for me to love you and you to love me right back. He would begin to show us how to treat each other and teach us what that would look like. So when Jesus shows up on the scene, he's proclaiming the good news of God and people would gather from far and they would come and listen just to get close to him. Maybe in earshot, they could hear the stories that he would tell. And Jesus leans into this parable. He knows this audience so well. He knows the diversity of the audience. He knows there are some, they're right on the edge of faith. He knows that some of them, their hearts are conditioned. They're ready to receive. But he knows that there are some people who are out there as they've gathered in the crowd. They're more about, they're just kind of checking out the scene. They're doing what everybody else is doing. They've moved up close to Jesus, but they really have no interest in changing, following, making a difference. Jesus is going to begin to understand this is part of my audience. And he would look from first century 
And he would look all the way through the timeline to the moment that you and I are in now. And he would see. There's going to be people within earshot as they hear my truth, as my ways are proclaimed, there are going to be some that are ready to receive it. And there are going to be some that... And Jesus begins to set up this parable with the purpose of helping us to understand and to see and to evaluate which one might be us. And so here's what he does. He says, listen, here's the parable. A farmer went out to sow his... And as he was scattering the seed, some fell... And the birds came up and ate it up. He goes on and he says this, some fell on and where it did not have much, it sprang up quickly because the soil was, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and suddenly they became withered because they, they had no root. Verse seven, he says, other seed fell among the which grew up and choked the plant so that they did not bear again. And then in verse eight, watch the contrast. So he's giving you a few different soil types. Now watch this. He says, still other seed fell on. It came up and grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, 60, some a hundred times over. That was one of the amazing things that I would see in my garden is by planting one small seed, how it could grow into a tomato that now had hundreds, if not thousands of seeds within this one fruit. And Jesus is painting this picture. He's using the botanical analogy. And then he goes on and he says this in verse nine. Watch what he says. He says, Jesus says, let's read this whole line together. Are you ready? On three, one, two, and three. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And Jesus is seeing this moment, his audience, and he's telling them, he's telling you, if you have ears to hear, pay attention. You need to hear what's coming. You need to understand why this matters. And so Jesus is telling these stories, these parables, and his disciples, oftentimes, they would just, they, they were like head scratchers. It's like, like what? Like, I, I, okay, I get some of it, but where are you going with it? They would begin to ask Jesus these questions of what does this parable mean? Help us to understand what you're doing. Jesus, we know that you've come to declare and proclaim the kingdom of God. We've heard your stories but what did you mean here? And so he begins to unpack this. Watch this. So they're asking him for some understanding, and Jesus begins to reply back to them, and this is what he says. Don't you understand this parable? Don't you get it? Like, hasn't it gone from here to here? And don't you understand this parable? If you don't, then how can you understand any of the parables? Now, let's just throw in a little time out for a moment. If the disciples who were following Jesus around, they could misunderstand a parable. And maybe you and I would misunderstand a parable too. So I want to take a second and make sure that you and I have understanding. Can we do that? Okay, so here's the framework for this. There's a few different components or pieces of this parable, right? So here they are. Here's the few pieces of this. There's the sower, the seed, and the soil. The sower, the seed, and the soil. Okay, so who is who and who's doing what? Now, I'm going to ask you this, okay? So who's the sower? Okay, good, good. So in this parable, there is a farmer, and the farmer is going and casting seed, right? The parable says that the farmer, the sower, he represents... Okay, we've got that much established. Good, 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 good. Okay, what's the seed? The word, okay? The truth of God, the word of God. And so here's the farmer, here's the sower, and now he's going and scattering, it says, casting seed. What does that mean so far? Okay, he's spreading truth. He's sharing the word. He's telling about the kingdom of God. He's going and he's planting these seeds. His goal is to share this truth. And we've got the sower, the seed, and here's the piece that matters. Okay, this is going to happen regardless. I'm going to say this again. God, as the sower, is constantly speaking, sharing truth, inviting you, showing you what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like. God is constantly speaking. Now, there's a conditional element 
inside of the parable. And that is the condition of, of the soil. It's the condition of the soil. Now, who is responsible for the soil? We are. What does the soil represent? The innermost core part of our heart on the inside of us. And so when he begins to unpack this parable and he says, hey, if you're going to understand this whole thing, you got to see a few pieces of this and how they're stitched together and who's responsible for what. There's the sower, which is God, and he's sowing seed. And then there's the third party, which is me, which is you, which is everybody in earshot that he says, if you have ears, let them hear. Well, this is what he's saying. This condition of this soil is going to matter. In fact, there's this key question, this critical tension, this thing that he's asking up underneath all of it, and it's woven through the whole thing. While he doesn't say it in this way, it is what he's asking. He's asking me. He's asking them. He's asking you. Here's the question, is which soil condition am I? Now, as he's telling this parable and every disciple is listening, as we're going through the parable and you hear this word, which one are you? When God speaks, when he prompts your heart, when the Holy Spirit begins doing something in you and, and you feel like maybe he's leading you in a way, what do you do with that? When God's word says, and it's really clear, do you receive it? Do you reject it? This way of framing the question as we go through this, and he says, let me help you to understand what the parable looks like. Jesus then begins to unpack it himself. Let me help you to understand. This is what he begins to say. So he goes into verse 14. He's going to explain the parable. And this farmer begins to go out and sow. In verse 15, what's he doing? He's sowing seed, and then it's going to begin to land in different places. What God says, his word, his truth, it's going out, and it's going to be landing in different places, in different soils, in different conditions. And this is reflective of, of my heart and your heart. So some people, this is what Jesus, he goes back and he's explaining the parable now later in verse 15. He says, some people are like seed, that is, what's the word? Along the path where the word is sown, and as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and does what? Takes away the word that was sown. Now, you may know this, but farmers out often before season, what do they do? They go out and they plow their fields. Why do they plow their field? to get the soil ready, to break up the soil. The soil has become hardened on the surface. I don't know if you've ever tried to plant a seed on top of soil that has not been broken up before. It does not work. It sits on top of the surface and therefore cannot get what it needs to begin to grow. And so Jesus is saying there's actually a heart condition that is like this, that is like a hard soil. And he's gonna pose the question, the tension sits in there that some people their condition is like this. Some people's hearts are this way. And maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's a person who it's just, they're indifferent. They've heard all of this stuff before. Yeah, I know, John three sixteen. God loves me. But they're indifferent. That, that's good for you, and it's true for you, and I'm glad for you, but it's not okay for me. It's not for me. There are some people whose heart is hard and they are rejecting truth even though it's shared with them. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody about their faith and it just is, is quickly shut down? Yeah. <laughs> I was that guy. Yeah. Right, this is what happens when there's a hardening of the heart. Maybe it's an intellectual rejection. Like Some of us are processes, we're analytical, and so we begin to look and, and God would say, but we quickly justify, we quickly rewrite. There is some of us that if we were really gonna call it what it was, that just because God says it doesn't mean a whole lot to you. You're indifferent to it. Your heart has become callous and you've actually replaced the ability for God to speak in certain ways and said, you know what, my way trumps your way. 
And this is what happens when our heart, and this is why the word warns us that a hardened heart, that the soil that's represented here, it becomes a calloused heart. It means that God is speaking. He tries to get your attention. He tries to show you the pictures. He tries to show you how much he loves you and tries to invite you into the ways and into the kingdom of God. But when we continue to reject and turn off, the voice of God then begins to become less and less. It becomes more and more silent in our life. And this is a dangerous place. Some people will come to church, just like in the first century audience, where some people would move up next to the teachings of Jesus. Some people will show up on Sundays like today just because it's tradition, just because it was a good idea. No intention of actually receiving and responding to what God might actually be saying to you. And Jesus would ask this first century audience, and he would ask us, is this the condition of your heart? Do you ever find yourself just kind of callous to it all, going through the motions, showing up because it's the thing you're supposed to do? How receptive are you to God's word and God's teaching? There would be an entire group of people that this would be the condition of the soil, the condition of their heart. Jesus goes on and he explains the parable and it wouldn't just stop there. There would be those, not just with a rocky, or not just with a hardened heart, but those with rocky ground. He would begin to explain it this way. He says, other people, their soil, their heart, it's like the seed that's sown on rocky places. Now watch this. They hear the word and at once they, and they, and they receive it with, but since they have they last only a, and when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly, now this one, oh my goodness. Now watch this. This is a person who is actually receptive to the word. They show up, they hear the good news, they respond, God's speaking, he's prompting. Sometimes what happens in a church service like this is God shows up in a way and he begins speaking to your heart. He may do that this very day. He puts his finger on something, begins talking to you about it. I don't know what it is, but you know what it is. And he's prompting you inside of your heart. And you receive it with, yeah, this is the day the Lord's made. It's going to make a difference in my life. And then we walk out those doors. Something happens to us. What happens to us? Life begins to happen. Trouble, persecution, and now because, because I have no, I have no root. See, so oftentimes we are fixated on the fruit, but because I have no root, when there is no root, there cannot be lasting fruit. And this is why you end up with these places of bad fruit decaying fruit, rotten fruit, bitter fruit. You've seen this in people's lives. You might have experienced it in your own life. I've grown some rotten, bitter fruit before. And Jesus is showing this picture here. He's like, despite our best intentions, I receive it with joy. When we do not have depth, when there is no root, when we are not anchored to something, when the wind comes, when the storm comes, well, we're not rooted, and therefore we fall uh, away. And so let me just ask you this question. Have you ever met somebody like this before? Have you ever seen that happen? Yeah, it's kind of like the flash in the pan, isn't it? It's a shooting star. It rises quickly, but burns out and fades away. This happens to people. I've seen this as a pastor within church. There's no root, there's no growth. I remember for me, whenever I first got saved, I was so excited, I received the word, it changed my heart. But then I went off to school, off to university, and I didn't have root, I didn't have relationship, I didn't have people around me, and there was a falling away. That's what happens. And he's warning, he's saying that we should investigate, we should look to our own hearts, we should see if we have Depth, if we have root, or if our commitment to God is based on circumstances. I'm good with God as long as things are good. 
There's another group of people that he says in verse 18, he says, still others, they're like this. They're like a seed among, come on, help me out. Don't drop off with me. They're like a seed among, yeah, they're among thorns. They hear the word. Mm. You see it? The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in. And what do they do? They chirk out the word, making it indeed unfruitful. Now, this happens more often than maybe you even want to admit because it might happen to you. And I don't mean this as judgment. This is being mindful of the condition. And we're going to ask the question of, well, how do I grow? How do I get through this? And so some of you, you'll have faith in a moment like this, and God is speaking to you, and you'll try to stand on the conviction of God's truth and his word. But then all of your worries, all of your what ifs, all of the anxieties, all of the fears, all of the things begin to grip your heart again. And what happens is God's truth is taken away from you, and now it's replaced with a lie. And now you're holding on to this idea, and it's conditioned your heart in such a way that you actually cannot walk out the truth of what you believe. And this is what happens when the thorns are there. The thorns get in the way, and maybe it's the worries of life. Maybe it's the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires that we get in these places where we're chasing the distractions of this world. If I can just build up my bank account, well, that's going to make everything easy. I can return back to Jesus. I can deal with that stuff once I get this supply met. These desires that we have for things that are outside of the will of God. There are these thorns, these things that get choking out God's word. You know, one of the things that I have discovered as I've been gardening, and I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this one, the pictures that I showed you were not from this year. Because if you were in my backyard for this year, you would see that there is no garden. There is only thorns and choked out soil weeds. You know what we realized? Is it did not take long for us to neglect, for us to stop looking at the condition of, for us to stop inspecting. What happens is these thorns are like weeds. And I don't know if you know this, but they have the ability to choke out the life of, to keep something from growing, to take the nutrients, to pull away from. And I've seen this in my own garden to where there's nothing left and it's been completely overtaken. This is what happens to some of us in our lives. We allow things that should not have ever been allowed to grow there to begin to grow. Those things begin to choke us out it grabs a hold of, it takes away from. And oftentimes there's weeds that are sitting there that we just haven't dealt with. It might be like an unaddressed sin, something that we've just kind of let sit below the surface. And if we don't check the condition of our heart in these moments, here's what Jesus is saying to you. It will come and choke any hope of you producing lasting fruit in your life. Do you see it? And so when God is speaking, when his word, when his truth, and he's trying to land it in your heart, whether it's through scripture, whether it's through a sermon, whether it's through a colleague or a friend who's sharing word, whether it's God speaking through the Holy Spirit to your heart, when he's speaking to you and we turn back into our worry, this is what it produces for us, this place of unfruitfulness in our life. And so he gives us these different soil types, these conditions that ask the question, what's my heart like? How receptive am I to God's ways and to God's words? He helps us to see these places that he desired to plant seed, but for whatever reason, it was fell on hard soil, it was choked out, it was a distraction, it could never get what it needed. And then he shows us by contrast, Good soil, a heart that's receptive, that hears the word, that responds to the word, that allows the word to change us, to shape us. He begins to show us this picture and ask the question of, is, is your heart good soil? He says, other seed sown on 
good soil. They hear the word and they accept it. And here's what happens. What does it do? Produces a crop some 30, 60, some 100 times what was sown. Look, over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about roots and fruits. And most of us are fixated on the fruits, but there's something that must be addressed before anything that's above the surface can be what it should be. It's what happens below. It's what happens in the heart. It's how we respond when God is speaking to his truth. Is there room inside you when God's word comes when you read it in scripture, when it's shared with you. Here's the question Jesus was asking. I'm gonna ask it just one more time and I want you to identify for yourself, not for anybody else. Here's the question, here's the list. Is, so which soil condition am I? Which one of these would you say is most fitting for you? Now I know that many of us would like to say, you know what, I'm fully receptive. When God speaks, I am alert, I am awake and many of you are this way and praise God for it. But some of you, you're in this position where maybe today you've got some weeds that are choking things out. You've got some sin issues. You've got some things that have become distractions in your life. You've been chasing after these other desires. Your worry, your fears, and your anxieties have gripped you in such a way that now no fruit can be produced. Maybe that's you. It means that you have to own that before the Lord. What do you do if you're, you're number three? And this, this place of, you know what, I'm kind of new to this faith thing, and it takes root sometimes, but I don't have any real depth. I'm kind of shallow with it. And, and be honest with you, like I struggle a lot with my faith. Maybe it's, it's rocky ground. If you're the first one, and then you're this place of like, you know what, I've heard it before. I'm going to reject it. Look, God is consistently speaking, but it will be on you to choose what you will do. If you continue to turn yourself off and harden your heart, you will eventually be to a place where you just don't hear it anymore. And that's a dangerous place to be. So I just want to encourage you with this, is if your heart is in any of these conditions but number four, then you need to begin to ask the question of how do I cultivate good soil in my life? What do I need to do? How do I need to respond? When Jesus was giving this parable, he didn't just give this parable just for the, he gave it so that there would be an opportunity to respond, to do different, to do a heart check, to check what the condition of the soil is. And so let me just show you a couple of practical ways, and I don't mean to solve the issue today. What I want to do today is just you do an inspection of your own heart. Where are you at? How are you responding to God in this season? Now, if you're in one of these other places, these are things that I would encourage you to do. Is the first way to cultivate good soil is you need to not just hear, not just read, but to apply, to live out, to begin to walk out. Now, it may be uncomfortable at first, or you may be new to faith or a new Christian, and I I get it, it's a process. So start where you stand, grow as you go. Put one foot in front of the other. Begin to apply these things. It has to go from here to here. This is where it changes things. So how does my heart become receptive? I need to begin to receive and apply God's word. A second way of this is that we would begin to remove obstacles. If there's rocks in the way, get them out of the garden. We literally had to do that, get stuff out that did not belong there. If you've got junk in your life, get rid of it. If you've got things that are detracting you, distracting you, taking away from, pull the weeds. If you've got some sin issues, how long are you gonna let that keep growing? Let's remove the obstacles, and this will change the condition of our heart. Let me give you a third one. That's for us to nurture growth. (laughs) One of the things that when I was growing in my gardening is we're fertilizing, we're showing and and making sure everything's good, we're watering. And and in this process of your own growth, there's places where you do have to assume some responsibility. If you wanna grow in your faith, that means you need to nurture it. You need to care for it. Now, I'll give it to you, you've already helped a big way. You've shown up on days like today, awesome. Like, keep coming back. 
Another thing that you need to do is you need to get in scripture, not because some preacher told you to, but because this is God's living, active word that speaks and shapes. How are you responding to it if you don't even read it? You need to get in it, right? Okay, and then another way that you're nurturing growth is, look, you need to be engaged with other believers and other people in community. In just a few weeks, we're gonna launch into our community groups again. I'm so excited about this for the fall, but you need other believers that are around you. And it's this last one that I wanna encourage you and challenge you with just a little bit, okay? And that's patiently produce fruit. I just had produce fruit, and then I realized this is a big part of it. It's a really big part of it. And I've told you, so every day we would wake up and I'd go out and I'd, I'd check my garden a thousand times a day. I just want to see what's happened, what has grown. And when we planted those fruit trees, can I be honest with you? I was pretty disappointed. I planted those trees and I didn't get any grapes, man. My nectarines, it was like this big. Blackberries, right? This stuff wasn't growing, that first season, every day I'd go out there and I'd look for fruit, I'd look for fruit, I'd look for fruit, and nothing was there. And what I realized, it wasn't until, what, four years later, peaches and plums, nectarines in the backyard, grapes and raspberries. What happened was when I fixated on the fruit, I was paying so little attention to what was actually mattering, that if I would care for what was happening below the surface and I would give attention to, then the fruit itself would actually take care of itself. All I needed to do was take care of the condition of the soil. And so when I'm telling you this, look, I know we get in these places where you want to jump very quickly to like, show me the blessing. Show me the fruit. Yes. That's what I thought. <laughs> I know that's where we want to go. But there is a growth process that must take place before any quality lasting fruit can ever be produced. And so I wanna take you over a few weeks together on what produces that fruit and that growth. Today I want you to be encouraged and know that healthy roots, this is where it starts. This is what produces for us abundant fruits. And so where are you? Which one are you? What's the condition of your heart? How responsive are you when God's speaking? Today when I pray, here's what I wanna do. I'm praying for you, but I want you to pray for you. And I want you to pray, and I want you to talk to God. That just means have a conversation with him. It just means, God, if I'm honest with you, here's the real condition of my heart. If I'm honest, God, I gotta admit, sometimes when you're speaking, I'm stubborn. Sometimes when you talk, I turn you down. Sometimes, God, I'm not ready for what you have to say. You need to admit that. And then here comes the follow-up part. God, will you just help me? Will you help me to grow? Will you help to recondition my heart? Look, if your heart has become hardened, you can't fix that yourself. God, will you soften my heart? Will you help me respond to your word? Will you help me apply your truth and walk it out today? God, I want my heart, I want it to be the good soil, the good tree. I want it to produce good fruit. I wanna pray for you today. You pray for yourself. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you do indeed love us so deeply that you're constantly speaking that you're sharing with us, that you're calling us to understand and to live out your kingdom, to come into relationship, to turn away from the brokenness of sin, to experience everlasting life within you, to experience good fruit, good relationships, God, blessings, abundance. But God, we know that lasting fruit begins at the root. And God, some of my friends today are like your audience in first century. We're, we're maybe not as receptive to you as, as what we'd like to be. And I just pray for anyone who has hardened their heart, God, that you would begin to just chisel away at what might be stone. 
God, that you would remind them that you are still there, that you are still patient, and that you're still calling. Lord, I pray for those who may accept you and look to you, but just get consumed and caught up with everything else, all of the distractions, all the worries, all the anxieties. I just pray for them to have a sense of peace and trust in you. God, that their roots might go deep enough beyond their doubts. Father, I pray for those who are simply in the place of, of, of not knowing. God, one day responding yes and the next day no. God, would you help them to grow into a place of consistency? And Lord, finally, that all of us might be the ones found with good soil, producing good fruit. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. I want to invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to get ready to close and dismiss. Uh, here's a couple of things that I, that I want you to know. Is One is we want to pray with you and we want to support you. So if God is speaking something to you today and you want to share that with somebody from our team, if you just hang out here in this room for the few minutes and make your way forward, there'll be somebody here to engage with you, to pray with you, to talk with you. Those of you who are uh, regulars and we're in the middle of the summertime, I'm so glad to see you today. Make sure you're back here next Sunday. We're going to talk about one of the most important parts of what happens in our growth journey next week. So make sure that you're here for that, okay? All right. We want to help you to grow so that you might live and love like Jesus. Let us come alongside you. Be blessed in your week. Walk in the Lord. Respond to God's word. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, we'll see you next week.